Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Paul O'Neill, and on behalf of Kingston's Berry Treasures, I'd like to welcome you to this month's uh, presentation in our series. And tonight, we are going to talk about General Robert Hasbrook. Uh, and you may recall that uh, several months ago, we had a presentation on another General Hasbrook, General Sherman Hasbrook, who is actually a cousin of General Robert Hasbrook. Um, but while I was during the preparation for the Sherman Hasbrook lecture, and I know it's hard to believe, but I actually do do some, present, uh, some preparation for these talks, uh, I had been directed to Robert Hasbrook Jr. as a resource. Uh, and he couldn't have been more gracious or more helpful. And in our discussions about Sherman Hasbrook and about the Hasbrook family, we talked a bit about Bob's father, uh, his life and his career. Um, and you may recall that at the uh, outset of the Sherman Hasbrook talk, I spoke a little bit about Robert Hasbrook Sr. Uh, but I assure you, I scratched just the very surface of this amazing man. Uh, so we're very proud tonight to feature Robert Hasbrook Sr. And we couldn't have a better presenter tonight. Uh, our presenter is his son, Robert Hasbrook Jr. Uh, Robert. Hasbrook Jr. is, like his father, a descendant of the esteemed Hasbrook family, one of the oldest and most notable of our families here. He's very involved with the history of the Hasbrook family, and he really is a living embodiment of our historic legacy. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome tonight's feature presenter, Robert Hasbrook Jr. This being a Kingston audience, I want to establish Dad's Kingston's bona fides, which are substantial, dating from 1735, when Abraham, grandson of Abraham the patentee, moved here from Guilford. He established a mercantile business and stayed here until his death in 1791. He kept a diary for over 40 years which meteorologists say is one of the best surviving records of major weather events of, this era, of that era. Okay. Then came uh, his grandson, also Abraham who ran a successful shipping and mercantile business on the Hudson from his base in Rondout, also called the Strand. And he became known as Abraham of the Strand. In addition, he served in the state legislature, in the US Congress, and was a founder of the Delaware and Hudson Canal. Hasbrook Avenue is named for him. And this portrait is uh, by Ezra Ames. His son Jansen expanded the shipping business, including the transition from sail to steam. He helped found the Kingston National Bank, founded the National Bank of Rondout, and was president of the Ulster County Savings Institution. This photo, uh, or this uh, painting, uh, was uh, by John Vanderlyn, Jr., and it hung in my parents' house for many years. Jansen Avenue uh, is a name for him, and Hasbrook Park is on land he owned. This photo shows Dad's father, Jansen Jr., in front of his Walnut Street house where Dad was born. I've included the, these next uh, photos as interesting examples of the fashions of the times. This is Dad's uh, mother, Cornelia Wilson Hasbrook. <laughs> and her sister, Charlotte Tappan Hasbrook. And uh, very fancy for the times. Oh. 
And here's the future general at age, <laughs> age two and a half. And again at age nine. And here's an early example of dad's leadership talents. He's second from the left in this photo. And he was the leader of Kingston's first Boy Scout troop in 1910. Here's dad during his high school years at Kingston Academy. He graduated in 1914, the Academy's last year before op the opening of Kingston High School. He was appointed from Kingston to West Point in the class of 1918. This photo shows him in his first year there. Because of the need for additional officers in World War I, his class was graduated early in August 1917. And this photo shows him in his final year. Dad can serve as an example of the sharp difference in promotion between wartime and peacetime. He was commissioned as a, at graduation as a second lieutenant of artillery. When he reported for duty at the Presidio of San Francisco, the, de the duty officer shuffled through his papers, handed one to Dad, and said, I think you're a first lieutenant now. <laughs> By the time he went to France in the spring of 1918 to command a battery of heavy artillery, he was already a captain. After the war, he served in the uh, humanitarian Polish relief expedition, uh, then as both a student and an instructor at the field artillery school at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. From 1924 to 27, he commanded the showpiece Black Horse Battery at Fort Myer, Virginia, just outside Washington, where they performed exhibitions for important military and political visitors, as you see here. I love this picture, which brings to life the f famous artillery song, Over Hill, Over Dale, We Have Hit the Dusty Trail and the caissons go rolling along. The caisson was an ammunition carrier to which the artillery piece was attached. Here you can see them in the photo with the crew sitting on top on the left side there. And there are more in the dust behind them. And that's dad in the middle uh, with the black horse and, and uh, saber on his shoulder there. From 1927 to 32, Dad was an ROTC instructor at Princeton University. At a party there, he became acquainted with a Southern belle named Marjorie Nightingale, who had left her hometown in Georgia to experience the more exciting life of New York City, where she got a job at Bergdorf Goodman and studied the violin. Their subsequent courtship was not always smooth, and she turned down his first marriage proposal. But uh, fortunately for me, <laughs> Dad's persistence and determination eventually enabled him to win her heart and her, her hand. They were married at the Cadet Chapel at West Point in August 1932 honeymooned on Cape Cod and returned not to Princeton, but to Dad's new assignment as a student at the Command and General Staff School for highly regarded young officers at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Following artillery custom, the newly marrieds were transported onto the Army base on a caisson.
Their homecoming ended abruptly at an old barracks building. Seen in the background here, converted to student quarters. When the billeting sergeant showed them their drab, dingy apartment, mother looked around and said, well, it has a nice view. And the billeting sergeant turned to dad and said, sir, you sure got a good one. <laughs> Most of them cry. <laughs> mother got involved right away in extracurricular activities at Fort Leavenworth. Here she is, just two months after arrival, in a play presented by the local theater company in which she appeared as a bride wearing her own wedding dress. Her partner here is Captain J. Lawton Collins, who went on to become a four-star general and chief of staff, the Army's top position. Between 1934 and 37, Dad had a couple of troop assignments and graduated from the Army War College, another stepping stone for selected outstanding officers. By this time, he was finally a major. After going from second lieutenant to captain in six months in wartime, he was, even with an outstanding record, a captain for 19 years in peacetime. But as war clouds thickened and the need for a larger modern army was reluctantly realized despite widespread isolationist sentiment, the situation changed. Dad was assigned to the general staff of the War Department, the predecessor to today's Pentagon, promoted to lieutenant colonel in 1940, and given the task of two choosing mobilization sites to train an expanding army, which he did largely by flying around the country and uh, choosing sites from the air and then checking out their suitability on the ground. In March 1941, he was assigned to the 4th Armored Division at Pine Camp, New York, now Fort Drum, uh, near Watertown, where he commanded one of the Army's first armored artillery battalions. A year later, he was promoted to full colonel and transferred from artillery to the armored force with an assignment as chief of staff of the 1st Armored Division as it left for Northern Ireland to prepare for the eventual invasion of Europe. Six months later, in September 42, he was transferred back to the U.S., promoted to Brigadier General, one of the youngest generals in the Army at age 46, and put in charge of CCB of the 8th Armored Division. Also training for action in Europe. Word at this point about uh, organizational structure. You are probably familiar with uh, infantry divisions which uh, are comprised mainly of uh, three regiments. The armored divisions uh, were comprised of three combat commands, or CCs, A, B, and R. I don't know why the, well, the R stood for uh, reserve, but I don't know why they use that uh, because uh, uh, the three combat commands uh, shared uh, action equally, and CCR was certainly not always in reserve, but that's the way of the Pentagon or the Army. <laughs> And then uh, beyond the uh, division level, uh, going up higher, uh, two or more divisions comprise a corps, the number depending on the situation. Uh, two or more corps comprise uh, an army, and two or more armies comprise an army group. In October 1943, Dad went to England to become deputy chief of staff for General Omar Bradley's 12th Army Group, heavily involved in high-level planning for the invasion of Western Europe. He remained in this position as the Allied invasion took place in June 1944, and the American and British armies broke through the German defenses and rolled across France, Belgium, and southern Holland during the summer months. 
Here's a photo of Dad in the field with his supporting staff. But like all career officers, Dad wanted to uh, experience frontline action. And when a position was available in September, General Bradley sent him to command CCB of the 7th Armored Division, then with Patton's 3rd Army at Metz, France. Already on October 1st, the division was sent north to help the British 2nd Army repel a German attack in the marshes and canals of eastern Holland. It was a tough fight in, in terrain ill-suited to the tank action typical of an armored division. But the 7th held the front successfully, and on November 1st, Dad was appointed as the commanding general of the division. A few days later, the division was relieved by a newly arrived British unit and moved to a position on the Dutch-German border near Aachen, for a period of rest and resupply of men and equipment lost in their extended period of fierce combat while still preparing to uh, launch off to invade the German homeland. By mid-December, they were anticipating a quiet Christmas and had cards printed showing the division headquarters in a German castle. Little did they, or apparently anyone else on the Allied side, know of the large-scale German counterattack about to involve them in a fierce struggle for survival. Here's a situation map for December 15th. The blue line shows the front lines with the Allies preparing to invade Germany. Squeezed by the American and British in the West and the Russians advancing in the East, Hitler decided on a bold and desperate plan to turn the tide pushing against him by marshalling all available forces for a blitzkrieg, or as uh, W. Bush would put it, shock and awe, su surprise attack through a weak spot in the American lines and a rapid surge then up to the Belgian port of Antwerp to split off and surround the Allied forces in Holland and northern Belgium, demoralize the American and British public who were expecting an early German defeat and war's end, and lead the Allies to accept a peace treaty favorable to Germany. At least that was his plan. They would attack through the Ardennes, which you can see uh, shown there going through that whole uh, darker area. Which, oh, great, yeah. That, let's see. Can you see anything? So, uh, yeah, so this, this whole area is the Ardennes. An area with forested and hilly terrain not well suited to uh, such an attack, but therefore lightly defended by divisions just arrived from America or regrouping after serious combat losses. The darker areas, or the darker the area, the, the higher the terrain there. The German plan was to reach the Meuse River, which is uh, see, uh, shown up, up here. I have a hard time seeing it myself from here. It's around there. In five days to reach the Meuse and then break out over the open terrain, where, which is white here, and shoot on up toward uh, Antwerp. The attack was timed for a period of nasty winter weather, which would keep the superior Allied air forces on the ground. It kicked off on December 16th with a goal of reaching Antwerp within a week. 
before the skies were due to clear. It achieved complete surprise and initial success, but the Allied High Command quickly formulated a plan to contain it. The plan called for holding onto the north and south shoulders of the attack, which are let's see, up here and down here. while holding two key transportation hubs in the middle. I'm having trouble seeing from this angle. San Leith in the north. I can, can't see that too well. I think it's here. And Bastogne in the south. The American public equates the Battle of the Bulge with Bastogne. The battling bastards of Bastogne are surrounded. The Germans demand surrender. The American commander answers nuts. Patton charges to the rescue, a perfect scenario for the media. Bastogne was indeed very important, but it wasn't the whole battle by any means. On the afternoon of December 16th, the 7th Armored Division received orders to move immediately to San Vith, around 50 miles to their south. Reacting with remarkable speed, the division was on the road shortly after midnight. The German timetable called for taking San Vith already on the 16th, the first day. But the nasty winter weather, as well as unexpectedly strong resistance from isolated American units, slowed their advance. Military author Chester Wilmot described the initial action there in his book, The Struggle for Europe. At San Vith, the Germans found themselves forestalled by the 7th Armored Division, led by Brigadier General R.W. Hasbrook, one of the great men of the Ardennes. Setting out before dawn from their rest area north of Aachen, one of his combat commands covered the 50 miles to San Vith by early afternoon and the others by dark. This was a remarkable achievement for Hasbrook's convoys had to force a passage occasionally with the threat of their guns against the flood of service units and even combat troops retreating in dismay. That night, Hasbrook established his combat commands in a loose horseshoe around San Vith. Into this horseshoe, he gathered some remnants of the units which had taken the first shock and reformed them to fight again. Under Hasbrook's leadership, San Vith became a rock of defense on which the waves of the assault beat in vain. The map shows the uh, horseshoe defense at San Vith. Oh, I can't see it very well from, <laughs> from this angle. It's up, up here. And uh, also shows the uh, 101st Airborne Division surrounded at uh, Bastogne down here, surrounded but defiant. Here are a couple of photos showing the winter conditions that they were fighting in. It was really frigid, one of the coldest winters in about 40 years. This photo uh, is a good example of the narrow forested roads uh, in that vicinity in, in, in the Ardennes which led to colossal traffic jams on both sides of the battle. There were examples of generals standing at crossroads trying to direct traffic both on the American side and the German side. This picture shows the German advantage in armor 
with the German main battle tank, the Tiger, on the left, and the American counterpart, the Sherman, on the right. Note the size of the tank and the size of the guns. You can't see the American too well there, but you can see the, the, uh, the famous German 88 millimeter gun versus the American 75 millimeter. Okay, well now you can see the better the, the horseshoe here. As their timetable crumbled, the Germans steadily increased the intensity of their attack from north, south, and east. You can see the Germans at uh, route of attack here, uh, uh, north, south, and east in these uh, lightly colored arrows. They were attacking with four divisions plus Hitler's personal brigade, used only for the most important objectives. The direct attack from the east was halted by Combat Command B, whose commander, Brigadier General Bruce Clark, in later years became a four-star general in charge of all the U.S. forces in Germany. Under relentless pressure, the 7th Armored Division held onto its shrinking horseshoe around Saint Vith for the next three days, shifting its forces back and forth to repel repeated intense attacks. Every man was needed. Cooks, clerks, and truck drivers were on the front lines, firing their weapons for the first time since basic training. The intense fighting without reinforcement eventually took its toll, and with most of the units down to 50% strength and running out of ammunition, the division was finally pushed out of Saint Vith on December 21st and formed a goose egg shaped defense west of the town. Here you can see that. With their back backs to the Somme River, which it runs along here past the Ville Somme and uh, Somme Chateau. The Germans continued their three-sided assault on Dad's weakened and exhausted forces. And you can see them not only attacking directly, but sweeping around on both sides. So you can see how exposed and vulnerable their position was there. So at this point, uh, Dad requested permission to withdraw over the Somme River. Top-level American commanders with no appreciation of the situation balked. But British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, newly placed in charge of the northern sector of the Bulge, sent a liaison officer to the 7th Armored and on hearing his report, overruled the Americans and authorized the withdrawal. Thus, while U.S. Commanders from Eisenhower on down almost universally resented Montgomery for his smug, self-promoting ways. Dad always credited him with saving the 7th Armored Division. But the withdrawal was no easy task while still heavily engaged with the enemy. A number of rear guard units suffered heavy casualties while enabling the main body of the division to get across the two available bridges over the Somme at Ville Somme, where Dad's command post was located. One of the rear guard heroes was Lieutenant Will Rogers, Jr., son of the famous humorist who had given up his seat in Congress to take a lieutenant's commission and was assigned to command a tank platoon in the 7th Armored Division. He earned a medal for bravery in, in holding the attacking Germans at bay to the last minute. By nightfall on December 23rd, the withdrawal was completed and the two bridges were immediately blown up, preventing any further immediate German advance. 
7th Armored Division had held up the Germans for a precious week in the northern sector of the bulge and destroyed their momentum and timetable. Remember, they were supposed to be in Antwerp on the 23rd and allowed time for American reinforcements to move into position to halt the German advance altogether. The high water mark for their offensive was reached on December 26th. General Eisenhower sent the following message to Dad. The magnificent job you are doing is having a great beneficial effect on our whole situation. I am personally grateful to you and wish you would let all your people know that if they continue to carry out their mission with the splendid spirit that they have so far shown, so far shown, they will have deserved well of their country. Well, the 7th Armored Division did indeed continue to carry out its mission in an exemplary fashion. After December 27th, the momentum of the bulge shifted. American and British reinforcements had moved into position. The skies had cleared, and the U.S. Air Force descended on the Germans with deadly effect. American industry was supplying a steady stream of replacement armaments. The Germans were literally running out of gas and equipment and had no reserves to reinforce them. Hitler had committed everything available to his grand scheme and had lost his gamble. By mid-January, the Americans had launched an offensive to erase the bulge, and now it was the Germans who were fighting for survival. And fight they did. They conducted a disciplined, orderly withdrawal. It was not an easy push to to restore the pre-bulge battle lines. The 7th Armored, rested and resupplied, set out to retake Saint-Vif, which it did on January 25th. Here are a few photos taken during their advance. The first uh, shows a, a tank uh, attack in the middle of a snowstorm. The weather didn't get much better. This photo has a special significance. Shortly after it was taken, the photographer was killed and his cameraman partner wounded. A few more photos. This one shows a tank attack uh, supported by infantry uh, on a village, uh, which uh, you can see buildings in the background there. And there's only one infantryman in the picture here, but they're coming along behind the camera here. And here's a 7th Armored Patrol in, in San Vith, uh, dressed in uh, white winter suits to blend in with the terrain. And uh, the Germans had an advantage here, too, because they had been uh, in, at, through several winters of war, and they were issued these white uh, winter suits, whereas the Americans uh, didn't expect to need them and uh, didn't have them. So they, they uh, improvised and made up these uh, snowsuits from uh, bed linen that they could uh, requisition along the way. And uh, here's a 7th Armored Patrol going through the remains of San Vith on the way back. Here's what San Vith looked like after the, the recapture. Not much left of it. But you can still see the roads leading out in several directions that made it such an important communications hub. By January 26th, all the lost territory had been recaptured, and the Battle of the Bulge was officially over. Shortly afterwards, Dad was awarded the Silver Star Medal for gallantry in action in the Battle of San Vith. Here it's being presented by uh, General Courtney Hodges, the commander of the 1st U.S. Army. 
The citation reads as follows. Completely disregarding his own safety, he personally directed a successful operation which materially assisted other units in stopping the German drive on Liège. General Hasbrook maintained direct contact with the forward elements of his command and exerted personal influence on the action by frequent visits to the foremost positions. Although exposed to hostile patrols which had infiltrated our position and subjected to hostile tank artillery and mortar fire, General Hasbrook utterly disregarded the ever-present hazards in order to confer with his subordinate commanders. By his intrepid direction, heroic leadership, and outstanding professional ability, General Hasbrook set an inspiring example for his entire force. And in February came his belated promotion to Major General, which is the normal rank for a division commander. Here he's having his uh, second star pinned on by uh, members of his uh, staff. The Americans pressed their attack on, on into Germany and established a bridgehead over the R Rhine River around Remagen. In March, the 7th Armored Division spearheaded the American breakout from this bridgehead. In five days, it changed direction twice, covered about 150 miles, and captured intact the giant Ederzee Dam, the third biggest in Germany, before the Germans had a chance to blow it up and flood out the American advance downstream. It was during the approach to this dam that another Kingston hero, Robert Dietz, a sergeant in the 7th Armored Division, earned the Congressional Medal of Honor, single-handedly wiping out two German bazooka teams at the cost of his own life. I hope you heard about him here two months ago. For his skill in handling the division in their swift advance from the Rhine, Dad was awarded the Bronze Star Medal. Meanwhile, to the northwest, the Ruhr Industrial in the, in the Ruhr industrial region, the Allies had managed to surround a force of over 100,000 Germans, the so-called Ruhr Pocket. The 7th Armored next went there to participate in the elimination of this pocket, and they succeeded in a big way. Here is an excerpt from a letter that uh, Dad wrote to Mother, dated April 16th. This is a somewhat historical moment. I am awaiting the arrival of a German Panzer Division commander and also a corps commander who have surrendered to me. Day before yesterday, when we plunged eight miles into the pocket, we overran the 81st Corps headquarters and captured the corps commander and his entire staff. His arrival at my command post was somewhat of an event. Here he's the uh, German general is being uh, interviewed by dad on the right. The German Corps commander of the 81st Corps was most complimentary, saying the Germans considered the 2nd Armored and 7th Armored as the best of the U.S. Armored Forces. The 2nd because it was a great slugging outfit, the 7th because of its rapid changes of direction and shifting of the weight of its attack, which made it very deceptive a very deceptive unit to meet. Most elusive was his way of describing it. I asked him why he allowed his headquarters to be overrun. Was it intentional so he could get out of the war? He replied, we were on him so fast after a change of direction that he had no time to get away. I've lost count of the number of German prisoners we have taken since, I, since we started out on the pocket, but it must be over 20,000 and I expect a very large bag when we get all that are surrendering this morning. There are so many interruptions from excited staff officers at higher headquarters that I will have to stop. So uh, I mentioned this is the uh, 81st Corps uh, commander. And uh, this 
photo shows the senior officers of the 53rd Corps, which surrendered en masse to the 7th Armored, lining up there at the surrender site. And here is the formal surrender with the, the Corps commander of the 53rd Corps uh, in the middle there, uh, and his division commanders uh, uh, beside him there, but they're blocked by the Americans. Uh, surrendering to uh, Dad standing on the foot of his uh, command trailer there. <coughs> this picture, taken in 1979, shows the personal pistols surrendered by the four generals of the 53rd Corps. Dad kept them on a display board at our house, and we fired them several times at bullseye targets in the sand dunes of Georgia before he donated them eventually to the 7th Armored Division exhibit at Fort Polk, Louisiana. Here's a photo of some of the 20,000 plus uh, 7th Armored Division prisoners from the Ruhr Pocket. And here's a picture of Dad looking authoritative in a tank turret. From the Ruhr, the 7th Armored advanced swiftly northward through weakening German resistance and reached the Baltic Sea on May 3rd. This staged photo is symbolic, showing the end of the 7th Armored's journey from, <clears throat> as they, uh, was their slogan, from the beaches to the Baltic. This Sherman tank, with its tracks in the Baltic, was reportedly the only one in the 7th Armored Division that survived the entire journey. All the others were replaced along the way. This map shows the journey graphically. Dad joined the 7th Armored down here at Metz, took command of the division up in Holland, brought them down through the Battle of the Bulge and then over and changing directions as they mentioned. Here is the uh, Eterze with its big dam, Ruhr Pocket, and then all the way up to the Baltic here. As the war drew to a close, there was one more mission for the 7th to a accomplish a link up with the Russians advancing from the east. This task fell to Lieutenant William Knowlton, who managed to take his reconnaissance platoon in a convoy safely through thousands of German troops who had stopped fighting but had not yet surrendered and who, who were still armed, frustrated, and dangerous. Knowlton found the Russians and brought back two of their officers through the same German gauntlet to confer with Dad. This expedition was written up as a story in the Reader's Digest and was a foretaste of Knowlton's military skills. He went on to become a four-star general, superintendent of West Point, commander of all the U.S. forces in South Central Europe, and the U.S. Militar military representative to NATO. From May to August, Dad continued to command the 7th Armored in the occupation of Germany. One incident he related to me gave a foretaste of the difficulties soon to come with the Russians. The 7th was occupying an area to be turned over to the Russians under the terms of the Potsdam Agreement. It was on the west bank of the Molda River, and the Russians were on the east bank, with communications established between them over a prominent bridge. A date for the turnover had been set, but several days beforehand, the Russian commander announced that he was going to bring his troops across the next morning. 
Dad said his orders were to occupy the area until the scheduled date. The Russian commander said he was coming anyway. That evening before dark, Dad positioned a line of tanks overlooking the bridge with their guns trained on it. The next morning, all was quiet on the Russian side and remained so until the scheduled turnover date. When the turnover took place, the Russian commander was all smiles and good humor with no mention of this earlier standoff. In August, Dad received orders to return to the U.S. to become Deputy Chief of Staff and later Chief of Staff of the Army Ground Forces. His departure from the 7th Armored Division was described in the division's newspaper. After inspecting his escort, shaking hands with staff officers and speaking briefly to the enlisted men of the division headquarters and the band, General Hasbrook stepped into his open car and to the tune of Auld Lang Syne was whisked to the open road on his way to the States. And then came the real surprise. Along the road were the troops of all the units of the 7th Armored lining the road on either side in precise single file, presenting arms as the general's limousine rolled along behind the armored cars, half-tracks, and light tanks of his escort. The general was surprised and showed it. He returned the salutes of the twin avenues of his men and smiled broadly, proudly. His boys were on hand to wish him Godspeed to say au revoir to the man who had led them so brilliantly and successfully through the bitter struggles of the war against the Germans. After passing some six miles of twin lines of the 7th Armored Men and rolling onward to the edge of Buchan County, which the division occupies, the honor guard halted. The general rode slowly by the still vehicles, receiving and returning the last salute of his troops. His were mixed emotions. He had been thoroughly surprised and was humbled to know that the division so sincerely regretted his departure. At the last moment, he seemed reluctant to leave, but he smiled with pride, took a last look at the troops that represented the command he was relinquishing, and drove on toward Paris and the USA. Further acknowledgement of Dad's military accomplishments continued after the end of the war. General Hasso von Manteuffel, who commanded the German 5th Army attacking Sanvith and later became an advisor to NATO, credited the 7th Armored Division's stand as crucial in the failure of the, general, of the Germans' final great offensive, an opinion shared by military historians studying the battle. In April 1946, Dad was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, the third highest military decoration for his overall performance in command of the 7th Armored Division. Here's a photo of Dad in his post-war position as Chief of Staff of the Army Ground Forces. In 1947, the accumulated stress of the war led to dangerously high blood pressure condition. Back then, they didn't have all the medical advances we now enjoy, and this condition forced his retirement from the Army in September after a 30-year career. But he continued to be active on a reduced scale. In 1948, he served on the Hoover Commission which, among other things, was analyzing the World War II experience to develop a more effective senior command structure for the armed forces. Dad recommended the creation of the position of chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a position we now take for granted. Obviously, it was approved, and the first occupant of the position was Dad's former boss, General Omar Bradley. 
In 1949, he attended the dedication of Deet Stadium here to one of his former soldiers. In June 1942, 52, he was honored with a dinner here in his hometown. In the picture you see a local congressman at the time, dad, Toastmaster, General Jacob Devers, who was dad's uh, boss when he was at the Pentagon, or I guess it was still the War Department then, and mother and me, I had just finished my first year at West Point then. Also in 1952, he joined with his long-term friend, General Willard Holbrook. They were known together as the Brooks Brothers <laughs> to form the Federal Services Finance Corporation to serve the military community. And uh, here's Dad's chairman of the board picture. Throughout the post-war period, Dad helped military historians working on the details of the war. In 1976, the Patton Museum of Armor at Fort Knox commissioned a portrait of him for the Armor Hall of Fame. And then there was his continuing bond with the 7th Armored Division veterans who regarded him with respect, admiration, and affection. He helped many of them with service-related problems and attended virtually every one of their annual reunions where he and mother were treated like royalty. At the few reunions I attended, several vets individually took me aside to praise dad and tell me that he was the finest person they had ever known. Here's a final photo of my parents taken in 1979 at a small veterans greeting at their home in Wa veterans gathering at their home in Washington. Our family line seems to have good genes for longevity and dad survived his high blood pressure, two heart attacks, diabetes and congestive heart failure until August 1985 when he was told he could not survive longer without oxygen and a tube down his throat. In charge until the end, he declared he declined this invasive treatment and died peacefully shortly after that at the age of 89. His funeral at West Point was attended by a number of old friends and 7th Armored Division veterans, including General Knowlton, shown here, delivering a eulogy. And uh, you can see a line of the uh, 7th Armored veterans on the left and the right here, one of them holding the 7th Armored flag. And uh, that's me and my family there. I certainly share the vet's admiration and affection for Dad. He was a near-perfect combination of family man, military leader, and all-around human being. I've always retained the junior in my name because I did not want in any way to usurp his distinguished mantle. He truly merits the benediction of the West Point alma mater. Well done, be thou at peace. Kingston can take pride in its contribution to the early development of this outstanding native son. And I'm grateful for the privilege of bringing his life story to you today. Thank you. Bob, thank you so much. That, that was wonderful. And I think today we are actually honoring three people. We're honoring uh, Robert Hasbrook Sr., Bob's dad. We're honoring, again, Robert Dietz, who we did have a, a presentation here a couple months ago. And I think we're also honoring Bob. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was really wonderful. Does anybody have any questions for Bob? Was Bob Deist at the Battle of the Bulge with uh, General Hasbrook? Uh, yes, yeah, he was uh, 
they're pretty much the through through the campaign in in Europe and uh, up until uh, the approach to the Aders A Dam. Do you have any other questions? Let's see. Uh, just a, a short follow-up. Was there any uh, information that you got through all three of father's papers that uh, uh, Sergeant Dietz and he had a personal contact? Was he aware that he had a guy from Kingston in his corps? I don't really know. I, don't, I doubt it. Not bad. Two Kingston heroes at the Battle of the Bulge and beyond. And, and now, whenever anybody says the hero of the Battle of the Bulge is, is, is General Patton, correct them. <laughs> correct them. Yeah. Uh, uh, along those lines, I have a question. Did your father ever relate to you? Uh, I've read some books about World War II that the different generals had a big problem with Montgomery and, uh, you know, the way the war should be fought. So did he ever, you know, get down to earth with you about some of his problems with the other generals that he was working with? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was not all that smooth. You read in the, in the papers of this happened and that happened, and, and uh, uh, behind the scenes there could be a, a lot of dissent and... and uh, uh, competition and, and arguing back and forth. And Montgomery in particular, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, was uh, wise, widely uh, disliked by the Americans. Uh, one, one quote I remember was right after he had, uh, oh, well, first uh, Montgomery also had a totally different idea of how to run uh, the, the Battle of the Bulge and, uh, and the war in general than Eisenhower did. And uh, at one point, uh, things got so hot between Eisenhower and Montgomery that uh, Eisenhower said uh, either, uh, you, either somebody shut down Montgomery or I'm re resigning myself. And he, uh, that went to uh, Roosevelt and Churchill and uh, Montgomery backed down at that point. But, but he uh, infuriated uh, the Americans after the Battle of the Bulge by taking credit for it pretty much himself. He, he, according to him, he had uh, stepped in and, and, and uh, uh, bailed out the Americans. So, uh, uh, you know, there, there was uh, plenty going on there. And I also mentioned the uh, at uh, in the the fortified goose egg, that there was a, a problem there that the American commanders uh, did not want to let uh, the Seventh Armored pull back. Uh, they uh, uh, General Ridgeway was uh, the corps commander then. Dad was the division was assigned, uh, attached to him. They had come up uh, to reinforce the the area there and. Uh, uh, General Ridgway uh, was an airborne commander and uh, all gung-ho, and uh, he didn't believe in retreat, and uh, he said, uh, go ahead and let yourselves get uh, surrounded. Uh, we'll supply you by air, and uh, you can hang on until we get there to relieve you. And uh, uh, General Bruce Clark, who was Dad's the second in command there, I mentioned him, he muttered at that point, Custer's last stand. <laughs> because uh, no, they had really no appreciation of, of the desperate situation there and, and the fact that they were exhausted after a, a week of absorbing the, the attacks of uh, four German divisions plus Hitler's own brigade. And had the, the terrain was terrible for airdrops. Uh, the, couldn't have been supplied properly, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, it, it did take Montgomery to, uh, to solve that one in Dad's favor, uh, which is why uh, Dad, <laughs> almost alone among the American commanders there, uh, had, had good words for Montgomery. And to the, to the prior question, uh, 
uh, D uh, armored division has about 10,000 people in it, so uh, uh, that's uh, one reason I would suspect probably that D Dad didn't know Dietz personally. I'm going to like to think that they were good friends, <laughs> that they often met in the, in the mess tent. Was uh, that General Clark related to Mark Clark, the general? No. Uh, no. Uh, in fact, uh, interestingly, Mark Clark was a classmate of Dad's at West Point. And he, he commanded the, uh, the Fifth Army in, in Italy during the war. Uh, Bruce Clark uh, spells Clark with an E on the end, so there's no relation there, but uh, they're both uh, famous generals. Did anyone ever tell you of that picture of your dad in the tank with the helmet on? He looks just like Randolph Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Not that particular picture, but in fact the family did think that he had a strong resemblance to, to Randolph Scott. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, question over here. Joe, when did you first see your father after, after the war? Well, that's interesting. Uh, I uh, went to the uh, summer camps of the Culver Military Academy in Indiana, and uh, in the uh, summer of uh, I guess 1945, in August, uh, I was uh, in the, the cavalry school there. Uh, they had a, a, a cavalry, in, a, in the summer they ran a cavalry school and a naval school. And uh, as a perk, at the, when he returned from, from the war, uh, Dad was given the use of a, of a C-47 plane for, for a trip. And so he and mother f flew out to see me uh, at, uh, graduate from the cavalry school. And uh, that's when I, the first time I saw him was uh, when he came off the plane and uh, I was there to meet him. Not a bad entrance. <laughs> Did you have a, a long military career yourself? And can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, no, I did not have a long military career. I, uh, my, uh, I, I wanted to go to West Point from about the age of four, and uh, nothing would dissuade me from that. Uh, uh, Dad tried to talk me out of it, in fact, uh, which is uh, usually it goes the other way around. Uh, but. Uh, I was, uh, his reasoning was that the Army uh, uh, now isn't what it used to be and uh, uh, it's uh, more politicized and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't listen and uh, uh, loyal dad that he was, he, he helped me to, uh, uh, to get an appointment to, to get in. And uh, I should have known that uh, from my perspective that uh, father knows best. Uh, I, I served uh, three years uh, with the uh, uh, armored Cav 14th Armored Cavalry on the East German border uh, from 56, 7, and 8. And uh, then after some schooling uh, with, with the uh, air defense or artillery uh, in the Cincinnati air defense for uh, another uh, two years. And uh, by that time I was frustrated and uh, agreeing with dad and uh, decided to, to get out uh, before I was locked in by seniority. Uh, I could go on about why and thank goodness a lot of my classmates uh, didn't get out because uh, they were all uh, in uh, Vietnam at least once, some of them twice, and uh, certainly they uh, served our country well in a in an era where uh, that duty was certainly not pleasant. But uh, I didn't realize I was getting out of Vietnam, but uh, that's the way it happened and uh, worked out very well. Uh, an additional uh, thing of interest there was in the Battle of the Bulge, the, uh, the, the initial, the, the worst initial impact came on a, uh, Lightly armored, lightly armed unit called the the 14th Cavalry Group, 
and uh, they were hit by several German divisions and you know, totally shattered and uh, came, came back in, in disorder. Their, their commander uh, uh, had a nervous breakdown and uh, had to uh, leave his command to, to a, his second in command. And uh, Dad, uh, on his way into uh, San Vith, had to push aside uh, members of the 14th Cavalry streaming back and uh, uh, but he said after they, uh, after he collected them uh, and got them organized again, that they uh, did a good job there in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, by pure coincidence, my first assignment, uh, troop assignment, uh, was in Germany with the 14th Armored Cavalry, the same unit, in the same type of position uh, on the East German border, uh, where the uh, the major uh, invasion route from east to west was uh, the Fulda Gap, which is where we exactly where we were stationed. And I was uh, hoping that uh, the, the same thing did not occur, the, the same <laughs> that, that happened to the 14th uh, Cavalry before them. Well, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, that really is wonderful, and I can say this. I, I can tell how proud you are of your dad, and I know that your dad was and is just as proud as you. So thank you so much. Thank you so thank you. much. I, I, it really is wonderful that, I mean, one of the things that uh, when I was talking to, to Bob about uh, Sherman Hasbrook, I had actually said uh, there, uh, Sherman Hasbrook had a cousin named Robert. Uh, is he a rela relation to you? And he said, yeah, it's my dad. And he told me a little bit about uh, his father and then sent me some information. And after that, I, I couldn't believe what an impressive uh, individual he was. And uh, you could tell that as, as impressive as he was, he was uh, also humble. And, uh, and as that was one thing I've gotten through my conversations with Bob is, is what a what a humble and wonderful person he has been. He, he was so helpful with the Sherman Hasbrook presentation, and he couldn't have been more helpful or more wonderful tonight. So thank you again so much. My pleasure. And it's it's people it's people like Bob that really have made this this uh, this series uh, the wonderful series that it is. Uh, and all these other people as well. Again, uh, you know, we really stopped filling the list. It just kept getting longer and longer. But, you know, these are the, some of the people who have made this uh, such a wonderful series. And we thank all of them. Uh, and again, as always, we thank all of you. You make this worthwhile. So uh, our next presentation is actually going to, we're usually on the third Friday because of the holiday season uh, and uh, due to some scheduling conflicts, we're actually gonna be the second Friday. So November 13th, uh, we are going to have a presentation on the New York State Constitutional Convention, which occurred about a block and a half from here in the Ulster County Courthouse in uh, April, beginning in April of 1777, and, or no, beginning actually in February and March of 1777, culminating with the passage of the New York State Constitution on April 20th, 1777. So retired Court of Appeals Justice Albert Rosenblatt will be with us then. Uh, so we hope you can join us. And if this weekend is the burning of Kingston in Kingston. So there are events throughout the weekend and they're starting in 20 minutes. Over at the person house, the Committee of Safety is going to be meeting and they're gonna determine what the hell we're gonna do, the British are coming, where are we gonna go? So if you haven't seen it, I, I highly recommend you go over to the person house and they're going to reenact the, the Committee of Safety meeting to determine what, how they're gonna address the upcoming invasion, which is gonna start tomorrow morning. Uh, and so that is gonna be at seven o'clock over at the person house and at 7.45 there's gonna be a candlelight uh, tales in the old Dutch church cemetery. So if you're around, uh, please come and do that and join that tonight. There's going to be events throughout the weekend. There's some flyers out there, and there are going to be tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. here at the Senate House events throughout the day. So again, we hope to see you next month, and we hope to see you tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday through the burning of Kingston. Again, Bob, thank you so much.
had his house burned by the British in, when they came through Kingston. Yes, that was Abraham of the Strand. There were two Abrahams. Oh, that, was, the other, that was the one before him. The, the, oh, the first his, one. His grandfather. His, his son, Abe Brun, has, uh, Abraham Hasbrook of the Strand. His house was located right where the overpass, the bridge, 9W going over. They actually knocked that down, uh, I think, to make the bridge. He is, there were two, he's Abraham of the Strand because the other Abraham was A. Brune Hasbrook, father-in-law of George Sharp. So uh, again, enjoy your weekend. Thank you, we'll see you next month. Well, that was amazing, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much.